So in Romans 12, 1 and 2, and I know we know these all by heart. So let us, I beseech you, brethren, therefore by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be conformed to this world, that you be transformed by the renewing of your brain. Doesn't say brain. It says your mind. Hmm. Okay. That ye may prove what is, that what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Your brain will never make you prove what is the good and acceptable will of God, but the mind will. We're going to talk about the mind today and what the mind is. In Ephesians 1, 17 and 18, the Apostle Paul, he begins to elaborate on this out of Romans in relation to understanding this fight that we're in between our soul and our spirit and our mind. And he says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and knowledge and revelation in the knowledge of him, Christ, and the eyes of your understanding. The eyes of, say the eyes of your understanding. Now when we sing that song, we say, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. That's what we sing when we sing that. But this here, Paul says, the correct translation is the eyes of your understanding. It does mean the eyes of your heart, but it means your spiritual understanding of who God is. And it's very important that you understand who God is and who you are in relation to him. That she may know. So without the eyes of your standing being enlightened, you're never going to know what the hope of his calling is and what the riches of his glory is in the inheritance of his saints. So God says, I need your eyes to be open, but it's your spiritual eyes. And then he continues on and he says something amazing in Ephesians chapter 4, 23 and 24. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Everybody say the spirit of your mind. Of your mind. What is the spirit of your mind? The spirit of your mind. The spirit of your mind. We're going to talk about that today. And that you may put on the new man, which you're not going to do it without the spirit of your mind being renewed, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So God says, I have a work to do in you. And it's going to take some work in the inner man. So John the Revelator writes in the third epistle of John, verse 2, Beloved, I pray above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So what I just told you, people are willing to pay more money to get their soul fixed than they are to get their body fixed. Amen. Wow! God must really be interested in your soul, and if he's interested in your soul, so's the devil. So this connection between heart and mind is really important to God. It's really important to you, and it's really important to the enemy, because that's where the enemy works in our lives against us. So I want you to think about that. People are more willing to see a psychiatrist than they are to see their MD. The pain of the soul is worse than the pain of the body is what I'm telling you. That's true. That's Amen. 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 The pain of the soul. Beloved, I pray above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Now you know that's not even talking about money. It's talking about the pain of the soul. And Paul, John's saying, I pray that your soul is well. God died for your soul to be well. That famous song, it is well with my soul. Not it is well with my mind, not it is well with my heart, it is well with my soul. Who I really am. It is well with my soul. Today I want to ask you, uh, what, what if there was a way to wake up every morning and see God in everything that there was? Every morning you just wake up and you see God in everything. Your husband, your wife. The home that he's given you. The vehicles that he... The nature outside. I praise God I see him in the wind today blowing all those flatlanders off Big Lake and Reservation Lake. <laughs> I see God in that. You think I'm kidding. <laughs> what if we woke up every day and we saw God in everything that we encounter? You know scripture says there is a way to do that. There's a way to wake up happy and in the joy of the Lord by seeing God in everything you encounter today. I'm going to give you that Bible verse, but you're going to have to wait for it. I believe one of the most powerful forces God has given us is the power of belief. I used to think that the most powerful force God would give a person would be His power or the Holy Spirit. But you cannot take God or the Holy Spirit unless you believe in that. So God said, I have given you the power of belief. Right. Say, I have the power of belief. I, power of belief. I praise God that he's given me that power to believe in him. For he has given you power to become the sons of God. It took power to do that. Right. It took power to believe in that. 
So the most powerful force that God has given you is belief. That's what he's given you. Do you know belief is so powerful it can stop the power of God? What did God tell the children of Israel? He said, your unbelief has hindered me. Your unbelief. The Bible says that Jesus in the city of Nazareth could do no great work because of the unbelief of the people of Nazareth. Belief is powerful in the body of Christ. Belief is powerful in your life. So God told the children of Israel, I had great and mighty things, and your unbelief kept you in the wilderness. So Jesus said there in Matthew, and he couldn't do any mighty works here because of the unbelief of the people. Think about that. Is your unbelief keeping the mighty work of God being performed in your life? The Bible says it in Nazareth, he laid a few hands on the sick. Unbelief is so powerful it can stop God's power. So belief brings God's power. And unbelief stops God's power. And whether you believe it or not, belief and unbelief are both belief systems. They are both absolute belief systems. What you don't believe has the same power as what you believe. They're so powerful. Therefore, I say to you, this is what Jesus said in Matthew. He said, therefore, or excuse me, Mark, whatsoever things I say to you, what you desire, when you pray, believe. when you pray, when, when do we believe when we pray? Do we believe when we pray or after we get the answer? The Bible says, Jesus said, believe when you pray. He said, that's where the power starts working. I love it when people tell me, I'm waiting on God to do something. I, I put it this way, I believe God has already done it. I believe God has already done it. I'm waiting on God to move my husband. I believe God's already moved him. I'm waiting on God to move my children. I believe God's already moved them. Yeah. Belief is powerful. So we've got to make an, understand, an understanding of belief and the power of belief. Well, I'm waiting on God. God's waiting on you to believe. So what is belief? It's a deep conviction and perception of God's reality from his word. That's what belief is. All belief starts, true belief starts from God's word, because that's where truth is. It's a deep conviction and perception of the reality of God's word, that which one holds to be true. So it has to do with conviction, perception, truth, hope, and love. Belief is something that you hold to be true. It's conviction. The conviction that God has put in your heart is the thing that keeps you convicted from doing things you should not be doing. Belief is a conviction series of understanding. I have a conviction. I will not do that. I have a conviction of understanding who God is. So it's what you hold to be true. It's your perception about truth. Belief is trust and hope in God, a mindset about God. Train your thought to come out to a belief system. So when we train our thoughts on God's word, it comes out to a belief system of understanding God can perform what he has written. Belief is also written as persuasion. Paul says, I am fully persuaded, he says. He said, I'm convicted, I'm persuaded. He said, I know what God started, he can do. I know what God has promised, he will be able to perform. Say, I'm fully persuaded. Paul said, that's the way I live. I'm fully persuaded God's going to work in this. If I'm fully persuaded God has already done this. So one of the most powerful organs in our body is the brain. No question. I'm going to ask you a question. Can you remember things from your childhood? Anybody in this room, can you remember specific stories? How far back? I can remember back to four years old. Anybody else? Five? Five? Three. Three? Three? Think about how powerful your brain. Your brain can still remember that? And I'm not going to ask how long ago that was. But your brain is powerful. You know your brain is, can compute faster than the fastest computer known to man? Right, that's right. So my brain can remember a specific incident in my life when I was four years old when I got my tonsils out in McNary. I can remember everything specifically and exclusively about that process after it was over. So they are still trying to figure out how many cells the brain has. It seems like every time they do a new study on the brain, they come up with more number of cells. So we're hoping we find somebody that has enough brain cells to figure out exactly how many brain cells we do have. So far they can't figure that. So your brain is a powerful piece of equipment God has given you. But there is something more powerful than your brain, as powerful as it is, and that is your mind. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ, not this brain. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, not your brain. Hmm. 
Your mind is more powerful than your brain. And your mind is your faculty of thought and ideas. Paul tells us, renew your mind. Scripture tells us we have sound minds, right minds, whole minds, the mind of Christ, and renewed minds. Not one of them says brain. It doesn't say we have a renewed brain. It says we have a renewed mind. Let you have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in Christ. So what is your mind? Today we need to find out because your mind is where the battleground is. And everybody thinks your mind is your brain. That is not your brain. It is not your mind. The mind consists of two dimensions. And I'm going to talk about the first mind you possess is the dimension of the heart. And that is not the heart that's beating in your chest. Your second mind is the mind you have. And that is the culmination of the way you think. And they reside in your soul. So when you say heart, everybody thinks that what's in your chest. When everybody says brain, you think, well, that, that's, that's a mind. That, they think that's about, well, it's about your brain. But God said, I have a mind that I want you to have in you, the same mind of Christ. Say, God wants his mind in me. God wants his mind. He wants his mind in you. Yes. He's not talking about your heart. He's not talking about your brain. He's talking about his mind, his way of thinking, his understanding. Right. And that's what God is talking about. So the brain is definitely the faculty of consciousness. I understand that. The brain, not your heart. It's sensitive. It's five senses. Your, your, your brain is tell you, tells you that something's hot. Your brain tells you, hey, that's hot. Don't touch it. Right? So that's your faculty of consciousness. The five senses. And you operate in that five senses. Something tastes good. Something looks good. But I'm hoping right now as I preach to your brain that it's going to get down into your heart or down into your mind today. The engrafted word of God that it may become part of who you are. And that is in the mind that God has given you. So I, I want to talk to you today about your mind. The heart is different. It is the subconscious faculty of man. And I'm not talking about that beating in your chest. The heart is where it stores resolutions. It stores convictions. It stores are stored in your heart. They're not stored in your brain. The heart is where you believe and hope is stored in the heart. It is also where we stored all fears are stored in the heart. Ooh, now I, now I understand why the heart is so important. Yes, it's about hope. Yes, it's about belief. But all fear is in the heart also. It's the residence for your desires and deep hunger. They are all in your heart. And I'm not talking about that beating heart. I'm talking about the heart that God has given you. So here's how you got saved. If thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. You confess the Lord Jesus Christ with your mouth, and this brain made your mouth speak. But the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So your brain's controlling your mouth, but your heart controls what your mouth says. Right. Yep. Amen? Yep. So with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So your heart is what made you believe in God for your eternal salvation. So it was a culmination of your mind, the mind God has given you, the mind of Christ that understood, I need God. Right. Amen. Yes. I'm going to tell you right now, your brain is too stupid to realize it needs God. Amen. God has a spirit inside you that says, I need God. There's a spirit that we have in us, and God has put that in us because your brain is too stupid to receive God. Your heart gets too hard, the Bible says. The Bible talks about a hardened heart with the children of Israel, remember? So here's what Paul says. Put off the former way of life. Put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now Paul is talking about not your brain, not your heart, the spirit of your mind, the real you. It is your soul that gets born again. Amen. Do you know that? It's your soul that gets born again. Your spirit's eternal unto God. But it is your soul that gets born again. Your body is being saved. Right? right? Yep. So it is your soul I remember I was watching Titanic, and they were talking about all the people that drowned, and it was like, the number was like 2,333 souls, is what they said. Not bodies, not spirits. They talked about souls that had drowned. So the soul, beloved, I pray above all things that you would prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. Your soul is the real you. You, you can tell me something from your mind, and that's not the real you. 
The real you is what comes up out of your soul. And that's how I know who you truly are. And so the battleground is not just the mind. It's a very famous book, and that, that, there's nothing wrong with that book. But the battleground is for your Satan is after your soul. God was after your soul. He came to save your soul. So now you know because the soul is the realm of existence as far as happiness and joy and peace and understanding. That's why now we understand I pray that above all things that you would prosper and be in health, that your soul prosper. Say, it's God's will for my soul to prosper. It's God's will for my soul to prosper. God doesn't want you to have to go pay a psychiatrist ungodly amounts of money so that you can get your soul fixed. God said, come to my word and I will fix your soul. Amen. There's only one person that can fix a soul. I'm going to tell you that right now. And it is God himself by the Holy Spirit. That's the only one that can fix a soul. If you go to a psychiatrist, he will string you out and string you out and string you out and put you on dope and drugs and string you out and take all your money till you're broke. Man cannot fix the soul of man. Only God can fix a soul. And think about that. People will pay more money to heal their soul than to heal their body. The pain of the soul. And God says, I have a remedy for that. So I want to get deeper into this. So where is your heart? Your heart is really, it's not in your chest. Your true heart is the part of your being that connects between your spirit and your mind. Scripture calls your heart, and I just read it there, the spirit of the mind. In Ephesians 4, the spirit of the mind. That's your true heart. The spirit of the mind, not this heart. This heart can fail. This heart can, in fact, let me, let me tell you what the Bible says about the heart. The heart is deceitfully wicked. My goodness, I, I wish they would not have put that in the Bible. So God said, I'm going to work with something above that. Your heart is really that part of your being that connects between your spirit and your mind, your brain, your mind, the mind God has given. Scripture calls your heart that spirit of your mind, and I just read that. And it's in one, one place there in Ephesians. Paul is dealing with it there in Ephesians chapter 1. Open the eyes of my understanding. Open the eyes of my heart, my spiritual mind, my mind that God is telling me, I want you to renew, I want you to have a transformed mind. It is a culmination of this right here, the part being connected between your spirit and your mind. So this is what Scripture calls your mind. Your mind is not your brain. You can't trust your brain. How many have lived long enough to know you cannot trust your brain? In fact, there's times your brain is so stupid it's ridiculous that God even gave us one in relation to some of the stupid things we do on earth. You did that? Yeah. So you have a mind and you actually have spirits. You have a spirit mind and that is the mind of Christ that God is trying to get us to. And this is biblically called the heart. So the heart is not what's in your chest beating. It is the mind of God, the mind of Christ that comes be a connection between the two. So, as the brain is reflexive, your heart that God has given you is reflective. So, the brain is reflexive, happens quickly. Touch a hot stove, what do you do? You pull your hand off quickly. The brain operates in the five senses. But the heart that God gives us is reflective. It's part of you that ponders things and thinks about things. David said it, put it this way, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Was David talking about his beating heart? No, let the words of my heart. He's talking about this is really what God is talking about. This part of uh, who we are. Think about that. Let this mind. So the mind, God is saying, is Lord, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my spiritual mind that can be renewed in Christ, that can be transformed, that can be made whole, that can be made alive unto Christ. So David said... My meditation is going to be done with my heart or what God has given me in relation to my mind, my spiritual mind, not my beating heart. Here's, the, here's what I'm an example. The brain thinks about doing something not right. The brain says, hey, it looks good. Let's do it. But the mind, empowered by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God says, let's reflect on this. Hold up a minute there, Bogambo. Let's think about what you're doing. There's going to be a bad result to what we're going to do. And it is the mind that says no, the mind of Christ, that says no to the brain that says, hey, I want to do this. It looks good. It feels good. And the mind is reflective. The brain says, I have the reflex. It's, I see it. It looks good. The mind of Christ says, hold it, buddy. We need to talk. Yes. Yes. And that's what God is saying. I want your mind renewed. 
so it can override your flesh and your brain. Say with me, my brain, my brain. without God, without God. Is, stupid. is stupid. Amen. <laughs> I'll let you think about that. The brain is reflexive, but the heart or the mind of God is reflective. Your brain says, I'm too lazy to read the Bible. The mind of Christ says, read God's word and you'll be blessed. The brain says, I'm tired, I don't want to pray. The mind of Christ says, hey, let's pray and get the power of God moving. Amen. So this is the mind that God is really talking about. The mind that walks in accordance with his word. Yes. And God said, I want you to pray that you have a renewed mind. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your, not your brain, not your heart, the renewing of your mind. And God said, this is what your mind is. Think about it. Have you ever made a snap decision on something? And uh, it was not a good decision? And that's your brain. And that's your brain on drugs. The storage of the heart regulates the actions of the mind. Thy word have I hidden in my heart. And David's not talking about the physical beating heart. He's talking about the eyes of his understanding. Thy word have I hidden in the eyes of my understanding. So because in my understanding, I understand what to do and what not to do. So it will be pleasing to God. Right. Amen. So God has given us this mind, the eyes of our understanding. Whatever's in your mind regulates your life. If it's in your brain, that's, that's not really who you are because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So have you ever listened to somebody in a conversation and halfway through the conversation, you realize they have no idea what they're talking about? <laughs> Am I the only one that... that, that it, I, deal with, I deal in a business where people come in to rent trailers and they come in and they don't even have a hitch on their car. <laughs> we see it time and time again. I, I, now, the women I forgive... The men that come in like that, I'll be honest with you, I have a conversation with them. The women I just said, no, honey, that's fine, that's okay, you, you don't have a hitch, we can't do this rental. You and I believe the people that come in without a hitch. Do you know you are what is in your heart? Your heart determines what's in your mind, and it eventually does. And it provides a foundational material and framework, framework for the mind. So the heart gives you the material to work with. In essence, the mind reacts to the responses of the heart. The mind reacts, your brain reacts to the responses of the mind of Christ, which is in you, which is your true heart. And so now, what you've hid in your heart is going to come out when you get into a tough situation, a difficult situation. And you realize that when you hide God's words in his heart, do when you hide God's words in your heart, the devil can't find it. It's hidden from him. God is the only one that knows it's there. You're the only one that knows it's there. And so in any situation when the enemy comes against you, he doesn't know the ammunition you have inside of you to come out and combat him. I didn't know Stephen knew that scripture. The devil found out in the wilderness scripture. God, Jesus knew. Turn these stones into bread. Jesus said, let's whip some scripture on you. And Jesus whipped scripture on the devil. He didn't cast him out. He didn't holler at him. He didn't call him names. He just said, it is written in the word of God. Yeah. It is written in the word of God, devil. Yeah. Oh, shoot. He knows scripture. Jump down off this pinnacle. It is written. It is written, thou shalt not tempt God. Yeah. All he handled him with was with word of God. I got news for you. When difficult things come, what comes out of your mouth? Is it reflective? Reflexive or reflective based on the word of God, you know. Yes. When temptation comes, what comes out? Reflexive or reflective of the Holy Spirit? This is so amazing because when you get this in your mind, and I'm talking about your spiritual mind, this will change what you know as you read the word of God, and the word of God will take, be taken from words to doctrine. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against God. Well, guess what? If you're having a sin problem, maybe you need a little more word in your heart problem. Maybe it's a lack of word in your heart. Amen. See, the doctrine to me that, that I realize that I've studied God's word says, steady to show yourself approved unto God, a workman, right. that can rightly divide the word. 
I got news for you. You can divide the word to me and you, but I can divide the word with Satan and say, God said. Rightly dividing the word is powerful because you can divide the word of God against the enemy. Amen. Jesus did. This is powerful of understanding what God is talking about here, what Paul is talking about. Open the eyes of my understanding. Open the eyes of my understanding, Lord. Wow. Open the eyes of my heart. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ. So, you know, you can get a lot, of, a lot of word, but it does not change a person. Have you ever seen people that got a lot of word, but they live like the devil? I, I've had people quote scripture to me. And I mean, they can quote unbelievable amount of scripture, but they live like the devil. So what's happening is they do not have the word down in their heart. I've watched people steady and come to church years after years and, and doesn't change them. And that's why Jesus said there's a big difference between listening and hearing. Yes. I know people with a lot of scripture that still have a lot of sin. And there's a difference between listening and hearing. And here's what Jesus said. He who has an ear. Well, Jesus isn't saying you don't have. He said, well, some have ears. Jesus said, he who hath an ear, let him hear. Yes. In Revelations, he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear to the churches. He knows you have an ear, but he's saying, are you actually listening? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you really enjoy church more. I'm going to help you really enjoy sermons more. Quit hearing and start listening. Amen. Amen. Ever hears of the word, but never performing it. Amen. If you really want to enjoy a sermon, start listening. Amen. Not just hearing. Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you hear my words, but you're not listening. I was in a conversation this week with my wife. And halfway through the conversation, she said, are you listening to me? <laughs> I was now. <laughs> Hearing takes no energy. Listening is hard work. <laughs> listening affects every relationship in your life and how you listen. It's the number one problem in dealing with marriage counseling. People that don't listen to each other. Don't communicate to each other. They hear, but they're not listening. And Jesus told the Pharisees, you hear me, but you're not listening. It's not getting down deep into your spirit and your soul. Amen. I'm going to tell you right now, listening is hard work. And I'm going to tell you right now, one of the hardest things you'll ever do is listening to the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes the Holy Spirit, and I'm just going to be honest with you, will tell you something you don't want to do. He'll tell you to go forgive somebody you don't want to forgive. Anybody know what I'm talking about? He'll tell you to go up on a neighbor that's hating on you. He'll tell you to go tell your spouse, I'm sorry. I heard a big sigh there. My goodness, I'll move on. So, the eyes of my understanding, that's my true mind. That's the mind that God's saying, I want that renewed. It's not my physical heart. It's not my physical brain. It's the eyes of my understanding. That's the mind. The whole mind. The sound mind. The transformed mind. The renewed mind. The mind of Christ. What do you understand about God's word? What do you understand about relationships? What do you understand about being a member of the body of Christ? What do you understand about being an employee? What do you understand about God's word and how it tells us how to act and walk and live in this earth? So I ask you at the start of the sermon today, don't you wish you could just get up every day and... Just look at life through rose-colored glasses. Look at every situation, good and bad, through the rose-colored glasses of the Holy Spirit. I, I grew up on country music, and there was a song years ago by a man named John Conley, and he had a song, Rose-Colored Glasses. And he talked about in the song, he says, these rose-colored glasses that I'm looking through, they see only the beauty, and they hide all your truth. What if we looked at everything through God's rose-colored glasses? Okay, I'll put it this way. What if we looked at everything in life through the lens of a mother who looks at her child? What if you looked at your neighbor that way, your spouse that way, your children that way, your boss that way? What if I begin to look at things the way God looks at things? Every day I get up and I'm looking at it 
the way God looks at it, because my heart, I understand this thing, this thing pumping in my chest, that is not what God is talking about in relation to this mind. It is my understanding that God is trying to get a hold of. Yes. It's my understanding of life. In all you're getting, Solomon says, get wisdom and knowledge and understanding, he says. Yes. Paul says, open the eyes of my understanding, God, so I can really know how to live this life out. So I can know how to be a husband, how to be a father, how to be a spouse. So I can know how to be a pastor, how to be a friend, how to be a co-worker, a worker, a boss. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That is the mind that God is after. So be ye renewed by the transforming of your mind. So you can remember scripture that has not yet become revelation to you. Do you know that? So that scripture doesn't apply in your life until it becomes a revelation to your understanding. Do you know that? You can quote scripture, but until you have understanding of scripture, it's not doctrine in your life because you have no understanding of that. And God says your understanding is victory to living in Christ. Until God gets into your understanding, it's only temporary thought. Have you ever heard this expression, I lost my train of thought? Anybody ever lost their train of thought in the middle of a conversation? That never happened to me till about 45 or 46 or something. But you're in the middle of a conversation and you're giving a presentation and you just lose your train of thought? I mean, you can't believe in preaching how you can lose your train of thought. You have to segue into something. Thank God you know enough words. You can quote another scripture. Get yourself going again. That's how that happens, huh, Jim? Huh, Gary? Huh, Roger? That's why we got to know the word up here. Well, I'm, I've lost my train of thought, God. Okay, John 3, 16. I'll give that to him. So God said, I've, I've got a lot of information, but it needs to be understood. So the heart is the source of all change. The mind, which is, when I'm saying now the heart, I'm talking about the transformed mind. So David said, thy word have I hid in my heart. He really saying, thy word have I hid in my understanding. Because yes. it's when you get the word of God and it becomes understanding that it becomes real. And then it becomes not only doctrine, it becomes action. So that's how you got saved. You believed and confessed. I, I, I don't like this scripture. And I quoted it earlier, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart. The heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, not in his brain, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart. So the heart that we talk about when David says, I'm hiding the word of God in my heart, he, this is what he's talking about, that new mind in Christ. The mind of understanding. So you can say, hey, what's, what's on your mind? But that's not necessarily what you believe. What you believe is down here. In your understanding. It is in your understanding that we make statements that we wish we could take back. And I'll put it this way, it is in our lack of understanding we make statements that I wish we could take back. It is in your lack. I'm not living life looking through rose-colored glasses. I don't understand that God's working in this, and so because I'm frustrated, I come up with something out of my mouth, and I'm actually cursing the prayers that I've actually prayed. Any of you ever caught yourself bad-mouthing the prayers you've prayed in relation to the requests you've made to God? I ask people this, what's on your understanding today? What do you understand about today? What do you understand about the way God's looking at today? It'll change the glasses and the lens you look through life. It will change how you look at every situation you're facing. Amen. In Proverbs 27, 19, as water reflects a face... So the heart or the understanding of man reflects who you really are. Whether you lock it or not, your understanding in your life is determined by the way you see Scripture and God's Word. For out of your understanding come your convictions, your belief, and all truth that you believe. Do you know that understanding, do you know what it really means? Standing under the truth, you have anchored yourself in. That's what understanding is. I'm standing under the truth of God's Word. So in your all you're getting, get understanding, Solomon says. Yes. 
In all you're getting, God said, I want your mind to be renewed. He said, this is the real heart, your mind that understands who I am. So this mind and your understanding, the Bible calls the heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see. Open the eyes. And here's the Open the eyes of my understanding, Lord. Open the eyes of my understanding. I want to see you. I want to see you. This heart beating in your chest, it won't see God. But the understanding heart, spiritually. The understanding heart, the mind. I see who Christ is. He's the Son of God. He's my redeemer. He's my believer. I can now base my whole life on this concept and precept. I now have doctrine that nobody can change, including the devil himself. Because if he comes and tries to change it, I have word that will stop him in his tracks. Because I now have understanding in the eyes and the heart of my understanding. So what, what, is, what does Jesus say? He says, here's what he says. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as some did in the rebellion in the time of the testing in the wilderness. So Jesus said this, the pure in heart, the pure in understanding, the pure in understanding of the mind, the pure in heart, they shall see God. Yes. Jesus said, it's not me. Amen. He said it in Matthew. The pure in heart, they shall see God. And he says, in that, he said, blessed are you. Blessed are you that in your understanding, you have a pure understanding of God and his word and who he is. He says, when you have that pure understanding, you're going to see God. Now, why is this so important? Because he's he, he not talking about in the sweet by and by in heaven. And he's not talking about that God is going to come to your house every night and sit by your bedpost and talk to you and comfort you and cuddle you. He's saying, oh, brothers and sisters, in your understanding gets right, you're going to see God in every situation in life. And you begin to praise God in the good times, the bad times, the low times, the high times, the middle times. You begin to praise God in every situation because you now see God in every situation. Can I tell you why Joseph was so powerful? He saw God in every situation. He saw God in the pit. He saw God in Potiphar's house. He saw God in the false accusation. He saw God in the prison. And he saw God in the palace. You've got to understand. What do you understand about God and his word about you? Yes. Oh, let the eyes of my understanding. So if you want to see things through rose-colored glasses, you know you're getting an understanding of the mind that God wants you to have. The mind wants, that God wants you to have will over, overrule your stupid brain. Yes. It will overrule it. I think one of the greatest things of becoming a, de, a, a believer that goes deeper into Christ is you quit shooting yourself in the foot yes. along the way. Think about it. Everything you see, you see God's hand in it, God's work in it, God's design in it. You see his purpose in it. And I know you think you're, I'm joking, but I'm a joke. I see his purpose in the wind today. It's blowing for me. Amen. I see God's hand in it. I see God in you. Are you deep enough in the Lord that you see God in other people? Are you deep enough in the Lord that you can see God in other people? Oh, I know you can see all the issues and all the problems. I understand that. But are you deep enough? Do you have a mind of Christ into this situation, the true mind of understanding? I see God in them. I see God in them. I see God in them. Brothers and sisters, that's how God sees you or he, he would be destroyed. We'd be destroyed. Oh, ye sons of Jacob, if it weren't for the mercies of God, we'd be destroyed. God sees God in me. He knows the Stephen that's in me, but he does see God in me. How do you see life and how do you understand? It's based on your understanding. And that understanding is your true mind. So be careful how you treat each other. Maybe you haven't seen God. Blessed are those pure in heart for they shall see God. Maybe you haven't seen God because you're not seeing things correctly. Maybe you're not seeing people correctly. How many want to see God work in their life? Blessed are the pure in understanding. 
Open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my understanding, Lord. I want to see you. Have you ever met people that have wisdom and knowledge and you just look at their lives and it's like, man, they understand a lot of things. Do you know something? It's how you look at things that will bring the clarity of God's understanding to it. How you look at people. How you look at your wife. How you look at your husband. How you look at your children. How you look at your friends. How you look at your boss. How you look at extended family members. Anybody have family members that just drive you crazy? I'm trying to see God in them, Pastor. Let me tell you this. God used every enemy to promote Joseph. Every enemy Joseph had, God used that enemy to promote him. Maybe we need to understand differently about some of the things and people we're dealing with right now. God used the enemies of David to promote David. Thank God Joseph had an understanding of the enemies. Thank God he had the mind of Christ, which told him how to understand this situation with Potiphar. Joseph understood. Say, I need understanding. I need understanding of how to live in this situation. I need understanding with my wife, my husband, my family, my children, my mother, my wife. I need understanding. That's the mind God's asking you to live with. A mind that understands. But now I can put my rose-colored glasses on because I see God in this. I see God in this. I see God in this now. I'm understanding this because I'm looking at it the way God understands. Joseph got thrown in the prison. He could, could have and should have by Egyptian law go to the gallows. That was the punishment. That was the punishment. We had never known of Joseph, heard of Joseph, had that happened. So it is the spirit of the mind, your understanding, that God is after, and so is the enemy. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in understanding. Blessed are the pure that have the correct understanding of mind of the way God's looking at things. That'll change everything in your life. Any problem you face this week, I want you to put on a pair of glasses and say, I'm looking at it the way God looks at it. I'm looking at it the way God looks at it. I'm asking you, commit to that. Who by your hand? You'll commit to that. This I'm going to look at this the way God says to look at it. I'm going to look at this through God's rose-colored glasses. And I'm going to see all the beauty, His beauty. Amen. And I'll let God decide the truth. Yes. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And Jesus was saying, you're going to see God in everything. You're going to see God in this sermon. You're going to see God in all that you do. If you really want church to be exciting, start listening. Not just hearing. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. I can tell you right now, this is not easy. It's not easy. But get yourself a pair of rose-colored glasses. And say, I'm looking at it through the eyes of God. His understanding. His ability. Amen. Stand up for the word. The blessing of the... But what if we just begin to live our lives just looking at things the way God looks at them? Not always in a fret. Not always living in emotion. Not always living in a tizzy. Ever meet people that are in a tizzy over anything? Today I want to tell you, open the eyes of our understanding, Lord. Father, open the eyes of their understanding in relation to this, this word. And God said unto Aaron, excuse me, God said unto Moses, you tell Aaron, I command you, speak these words over my children. I command you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And God said, if you'll put my name on your children... I want you to understand I'm after them too. I want you to understand, quit crying about it, whining about it, start praising me about it and for it, because I'm after them too. God, open the eyes of the understanding of every person in here that are worrying and fretting about their children, that they would understand God's at work in their lives. 
We have prayed, we've asked, we believe for our children and grandchildren, Father. So now we're confessing it. Praise you. We praise you and thank you for it. So, ladies, today, God bless you. All you mothers out there, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance on you and give you his peace. And I pray and speak this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God bless you. You're dismissed. Amen. Happy Mother's Day, ladies. Happy Mother's Day. Hello, one and all. We have been receiving questions regarding where to send tithes and offerings. If you'd like to mail it in, you can do so at P.O. Box 2223, Sholo, Arizona, 85902. And please, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, share, and subscribe. While you're at it, like us on Facebook. Link is in the description. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Link is also in the description. Helps out us, helps out the channel, and most importantly, shows that this is a format you wish to see continue. And with that, we wish you a blessed.